our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for praying. <coughs> Leroy's going to come and bless us now. He's a special minister. <coughs> When uh, Helen was talking about doing a brain scan, uh, there was a character that was a <laughs> active generation, it's quite a character Ken was, and uh, he was having some, well, he was fighting some cancer, and he was having some uh, head issues, you know, with pain and whatever. And so uh, he went in, he came back, and he, well, he said he had a, you know, a scan. I said, uh, did they find one there? You know, was the brain there or not? He said, oh, yes. He said they found one. He said they told me it looked like it had never been used. <laughs> he was a character. <laughs> so, so you always remind every time somebody talks about Scan, you always think about Ken because he was a, he was such a character anyway. But yeah, it looked like it had never been used. <laughs> anyway, well, the pastor told me what he was going to speak on, and it sounded to me like it was a little down. So I picked out a song that was down. And I got to thinking, you know, uh, that's not a very good idea. One, you know, one woe is me is enough. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna do an upbeat song that uh, talks about the answer to the thing down because it's gonna tell you which song is the best song for uh, anything that's bugging you or seems to be kicking you down or whatever. So same way with the church, it's one of the best songs and it's actually called the sweetest song I know. So let's try it and see what happens. I heard them sing, he paid the price, and Jesus bore it all. I heard them sing, I'm coming home, and I hear the master's call. I heard them sing the modern song, songs of long ago. What amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, oh how sweet is the sound, no sweeter song will ever be found. I heard the sound and filled with love. The amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the sweetest song I know. I heard them sing, he paid the price in just a little while. I heard them sing, beyond the cloud, give the world a smile. I heard them sing, there is a fountain that washes white as snow. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, oh how sweet is the sound, oh sweeter song could ever be found. I heard the fountain filled with love. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. It was the song my mother sang in a sweet and humble voice. Like music from the world above, well, it made my soul rejoice. It's soothing words and melodies like rippling waters flow. What amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, oh, how sweet is the sound, no sweeter song could ever be found. I heard a fountain filled with love, but amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, oh, how sweet is the sound, no sweeter song could ever be found. I've heard a fountain filled with love, but amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, the sweetest song I know. I've heard them sing, the sound I know. 
finished up on the tag. They must have snuck about a half dozen different songs into that one. That's a really good song. Yeah. Reminds us the sweetest thing in life. Amen? Jesus Christ. Well, Leroy is uh, fond of asking me what I'm going to preach on. He's really fond of asking me on Monday morning at 9 o'clock what I'm going to preach on. Yeah, but remember what I, what I brought along. Well, he, yeah, that's right, that's right. He, he visits and he brings a donut, and I highly recommend that. <laughs> and uh, so, but Monday morning at 9 o'clock, I'm still getting over the last one. Uh, no idea where the Lord's going to lead, but uh, let me to 2 Thessalonians. It's a passage, a, a, a book of Scripture that... Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I've not preached on in the entire time we've been together. And <clears throat> I'd like to work our way through this second Thessalonians letter that Paul wrote as a uh, means of finding out what God would have for us and reveal to us in our time and our situation through what he revealed through Paul. So we're going to start with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1 this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you. Because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with ever, eternal <clears throat> excuse me, destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people. Praise from all you who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord, Jesus Christ. By that same name, may we understand and live according to the truth presented here. In the January 4th issue of a newspaper called the Epic Times, a reporter named Zrinka Peters 
wrote an article entitled, Does Religion Prevent Despair? And the substance of the article was offering evidence from various sociological studies that demonstrated a linkage between the decline in church attendance in our nation to an incline in what she called deaths of despair, like suicide and overdose. On a more positive note, she was also giving evidence that those persons who attend worship at least once a week report, and I quote, greater life satisfaction, more frequent volunteering, a higher sense of mission, a greater tendency to give to others. Well, that shouldn't be news to us, right? Still, it's nice to have some data points from secular sources that confirm what we have already believed, and that is that following Jesus makes a difference, and a positive difference. But it doesn't necessarily follow that good things will come to us, things that we find pleasant or appealing, just because we have been in worship. My answer to the question, does religion prevent despair, would be yes, but it doesn't always prevent difficult times. So good things happen when we handle bad things in a good way. Let's just state it that way. Now this letter is coming from Paul and Silas, or Silvanus, the Greek variation of his name, <clears throat> and Timothy. And in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, the Jews in Thessalonica instigated a persecution of these three men. And so in the first letter, um, Paul prays for them as they were suffering persecution as well from the Gentile part of the population of the community. And in the second letter, we see that Paul's prayers are answered. So, first of all, notice what this, this passage teaches us. That good churches and good people suffer bad things. How do we know this was a good church? Well, Paul goes out to establish that in verses 3 and 4. First of all, he says, I thank God for you. Now, friends, there's no better compliment than to hear someone say, I thank God for you. Secondly, Paul said that their faith flourished. Didn't grow just a tiny bit. It flourished. It grew. Now, persecution is an intense experience that divides between the mature and the immature or faults in faith. In a maturing faith, persecution will fuel more growth and demonstrate our worthiness before God. In the case of false or immature faith, persecution will cause it to fail. He says, third, they're a good church because their love grew. Their love grew. They had a greater quantity and a greater quality of love in their midst. In 1 Thessalonians, as I said, Paul commended them for love and, and prayed that it would increase. And here in 2 Thessalonians, he says, it is increasing. God said yes to Paul's prayers for this church. The other thing that distinguishes them about as a good church is that they were handling persecution well. In fact, Paul said, I use you as an example. Now, think about sincere compliments. Someone were to say to you, I use you, or I refer to you as an example of a good person, of a godly faith. Well, you couldn't ask 
refiner. And Paul said this of this church. In all of the churches who were in trouble, in all the congregations that Paul ministered to, he re would refer to the church in Thessalonica and say, you know what? Follow their lead. Follow their example. And you will do well. So we know this is a good church. We know in this life that good churches and good people sometimes suffer bad things, things that are not their fault. What do we do in those moments? And the balance of this chapter is Paul giving them encouragement when they suffer bad things. And the most important thing we can do, friends, when there are difficulties in life, is go back to our belief about God. What do we believe about God? And in verses 5 and 6, Paul wants the, the Thessalonians to believe that God uses bad things, like persecution, to, uh, to do His will. God uses even the bad things in life to do His will. It becomes like getting a shot from the doctor or a treatment. It hurts. There may be side effects. But the intent is always to heal and to strengthen. We naturally think of persecution as being bad, but here Paul challenges them to think about persecution from God's point of view and see it as Him demonstrating justice. Now wait a minute, you want to say, they're suffering unjust persecution. Paul is saying, this is God's way of demonstrating His justice through you. How can that be? This will become apparent, Paul promises, when God punishes those who persecute them. If there had never been any persecution, there would never be any punishment, and without that, there would be no demonstration of God's justice. So all of these things work together, as he wrote to the Romans, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> and one of the things we know about true justice is that it involves two things. One, punishment of the guilty, and two, reward of the righteous and the innocent. And if you don't have both of those things, you don't have complete justice. So that's the first part of God's will in this situation. The second part of God's will is to prepare them. God uses adversity in our lives to prepare us for our place in His kingdom. Now, this time of year, we're not thinking too much about gardening. At least I'm not. All of my stuff is buried <laughs> under a lot of snow. But when we think of gardening, there are times when the gardener has to prune the plant, that there are lifeless leaves or, or branches that need to be removed for the good of the entire plant. And so God acts like a gardener and uses times of adversity to prune away the pieces that are unhealthy or dead. God calls us to his kingdom, but he has told us that we must suffer first before we enter it. Paul said that in Acts chapter 14, it's by, through many sufferings that we enter the kingdom of God. We may not like to think about it that way, but it is the truth nonetheless. And it should comfort us to know that the things that we suffer, even at adversity at the hands of, of people who are being bad or mean-spirited to us, God can use those, is using those, to advance His kingdom in us. Letter B. The second promise that Paul makes is in verse 7. He promises rest. Rest. Now in the short term, that means respite from suffering. 
I'm going to give you a break, God said. I know you're suffering. I'm going to give you relief from it. But in the long term, and more importantly, this is a promise of heaven, of eternal relief and from all things that are evil and unpleasant. God says, I know you're suffering now. Your suffering is temporary. Your relief is eternal. Third thing, Paul promised them that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, he will bring about complete justice. The kind of justice that we spoke about moments ago. Complete justice, verses 7 to 9. At his second coming, Jesus is going to be revealed to all people. Both believers and unbelievers will behold him with their own eyes. And judgment will follow immediately. His, un, his second coming is going to be unmistakable and glorious. How do we know it's unmistakable? Well, it, Paul tells us that he's going to come from heaven. He's going to appear in the sky. And as fantastic as this sounds, that indicates to us his uh, exalted status and his divine authority. Every knee will bow, Paul wrote to the Philippians. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some to shame because they have rejected him in this life. And others to great joy because we have accepted him in this life. His second coming will be glorious. We see this in Paul saying, he will come with his mighty angels and flaming fire. Fire in the Bible is a symbol of God's presence, but it's also a symbol of his judgment. And so we recognize the purpose of his kingdom, of his coming. There's a twofold description of those who are going to be condemned on judgment day. They refused first to know God, and or second, refused to obey God. Paul testifies that they will be punished, and that means literally pay a penalty. The penalty is also twofold, eternal destruction and forever separated from God and his glorious power. We don't want that fate to happen to us or to people whom we know and love. Instead, we speak the truth into their lives to draw them into Christ. The fourth promise Paul makes here is that Jesus' people, when he appears, will give him glory. Verse 10, we will worship Jesus. And folks, the description that Paul makes here should be so inspiring, so glorious, so wonderful and desirable to us that we can stand. Whether it's overt persecution, or more subtle persecution, or the difficulties that we face in life through injury or illness, adversities of any kind. We want each of us to be able to envision by faith that day when Jesus comes and we say glory to the one who died rose again so that we too die and rise again. What separates people of faith from those condemned to eternal destruction is that very word, faith. We believe the truth about Jesus, the truth that we have received from the apostles like Paul and have preserved through the ages. The truth conveyed to us in these pages. Two more promises. <clears throat> the first is that we will support each other. Verse 11. By prayer. Paul says, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to pray for one another. What are we asking God 
in verse 11, to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. Now that sounds like that's on us. But we don't make ourselves worthy. God makes us worthy. How do I know? Because continue reading in verse 11. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Paul prayed for that. He said, he said, I know you're suffering, but here's what I'm praying. I'm asking God to give you his worthiness to make us worthy. And then what's our job? Our job is to act like worthy people. To live out what that looks like and what that means and every good deed that our faith prompts us to do, to go ahead and do it and know that God has enabled us to do that. Final promise. That we will honor God in the way we live. Verse 12. In this situation where the church is being persecuted, they can honor God by simply being faithful, and so can we. Godly living is pleasing to ourselves and to others, but more importantly, it honors God. And friends, a good reputation is a good testimony, and we need to be careful in our life to have both. This chapter ends with the affirmation that Jesus is God. Look at the last sentence. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now that's not obvious in English, but in the original language, God and Lord refer to the same person, Jesus Christ. So, at the very end here, Paul reconfirms what is of central importance to us. That we are, we are able to do anything as we trust in our God and Lord, Jesus Christ. When we do good things in bad circumstances, we are honoring Him. Now, Christians in the first century, not just at Thessalonica, but in the Roman Empire as a whole, were in a difficult place. Because on the one hand, the Jews hated them. They thought they were saying blasphemous things about their God, that they were defying their traditions and their beliefs. On the other hand, the pagans also hated the Christians for pretty much the same reasons, even referring to them as atheists, because they rejected the traditional gods. They would not worship the emperor and made even more vile accusations showing their hatred of Christians. Now in our situation, outright persecution is a rare experience. In other parts of the world, it's a daily experience and a constant danger. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in those situations. But what does a passage like that mean to us? Let me finish with this very briefly. Six truths. First is, the more you distance yourself from popular culture, and the more you confront worldliness and sin, the more opposition you can expect. Two, the closer we get to the second coming, the more persecution we can expect. Three, passive opposition will turn to active persecution if we continue to go in the direction we're headed. Four, take this passage as a wake-up call to alert you and make you more vigilant. Five, double down on your devotion to Jesus. Not afraid of how anyone might react, but doing it entirely in love. And finally, 
This teaching can also be applied to any kind of hardship. Persecution is a trial, but so is illness and injury and adversity of all kinds. In bad circumstances, we can do good things and honor God. Amen? We're going to conclude as Paul did by confirming our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Hymn number 87, Fairest Lord Jesus. Would you stand please? And we'll sing this. Sing it from your heart. Sing it as a devotion to Jesus.